How many of you want to be successful in life? Good. Well, I'm glad you came then, because for the next 29 minutes, that's what we're going to be talking about. How many of you absolutely want to get off this campus out into the real world? Are you looking forward to that, ready to charge into life? Here's the first ingredient it's going to take for you to be successful out there in the world. And I don't care whether you're in engineering or computer science or the ministry or coaching or whatever field, these principles have to be there, absolutely have to be there. Principle number one, you've got to have a dream. I am convinced that successful lives always start with a dream. So can I ask you a very personal question? What's your dream? What absolutely is just churning inside of you? What keeps you awake at night? I mean, it's just so compelling in your life. What, what is that dream? Uh, I, I, I've got to tell you a quick story. Uh, when I was seven years old, my dad took me to my first Major League Baseball game, uh, Scheib Park in Philadelphia, June 15th, 1947. Philadelphia A's and the Cleveland Indians in a doubleheader, Sunday afternoon doubleheader. They don't do them anymore. And I remember walking into that ballpark. Oh, my goodness. I was overwhelmed by the sights and the sound and the smell of baseball and the color. Everything was green. The green field, green seats, green walls, oh my. And, and I woke up the next morning as a seven-year-old, uh, just compelled and overwhelmed with a dream. I mean, I, I wanted to be a ball player from that moment on. Uh, that was 63 years ago. And, and through school and then into college and, and now for almost 50 years in professional baseball and basketball, I mean, that dream just continues to churn within me. So that's why I ask you that personal question, what's your dream? A and by the way, I don't care whether you're 20 years old or 70 years old. Uh, when the dream goes out, your life begins to, to wither and shrivel. I mean, the dream's got to stay there the rest of your life. And there's nothing wrong with having new dreams come along. I mean, 25 years ago, I had a dream when I was the GM of the 76ers to come to Central Florida, Orlando, Florida, and help start up an NBA team from scratch, an expansion team. Uh, none of you were born at that time. I mean, Orlando in 1986, you understand there was no Skyline. <clears throat> there was no Universal Studios. There was no Swan and Dolphin. There was no big airport. There was no convention center. There was certainly no arena. There'd never been major league sports here, but that dream was just churning within, and we sold the dream to the NBA owners and to our community and to the commissioner. Uh, look at Orlando 20 years from now, not today, and they bought into it, and here we are in our 22nd season, and people ask me all the time, does this all mean more to you now than when you started? And the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. To see this dream continuing to grow and all that's happened, it means a whole lot more. So the first foundational piece that you're going to need for this successful life, you're going to launch into, you've got to have a dream. And, and let me just hitchhike with one little footnote here. It's wonderful to have dreams. But that dream's got to move into action. I mean, you can dream from now until the time you're 90 years old. But you've got to put shoe leather to the dream. You've got to move it into action. Vance Havner, the old preacher, used to say you've... Uh, Got to stop staring up the steps and start stepping up the stairs at some point. So remember, that dream's got to be move into action or nothing's going to happen. Foundational block number one, you've got to have a dream. Here's the second foundational block, <clears throat> courtesy of John Wooden, the UCLA coaching legend. Coach Wooden passed away last June at age 99, the greatest coach in the history of sports in America according to a blue ribbon panel that the Sporting News did a couple of years ago. I had the great fortune uh, to enter into Coach's life when he was in his early 90s. I ended up writing a book about him called How to Be Like Coach Wooden, and I've just written another one that's coming out this week just called Coach Wooden. And uh, one night uh, we were sitting and talking about success and what it takes to have a great life and be successful, and I had worked up this little outline, and Coach looked at it and said, looks good, Pat. You're right on this. It looks very, very nicely done. And he said, but you've forgotten the most important thing. And I said, coach, please tell me. And, and, and he never would tell you anything. He would offer it in a question. 
and Coach Wooden at that point about 95 years of age said, wouldn't it be preparation? And then I thought of all those interviews I did when I wrote that book, all of Coach Wooden's former players, and they all quoted him. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail, said Coach Wooden. So there's your second success principle for those of you eager to get off this campus and plunge into the real world out there. It's called preparation. You can never be prepared enough. You can never do enough homework. You can never do enough studying. You can never do enough absolutely grasping of the fundamentals. Preparation, preparation, preparation. And you know what comes with preparation? I've learned this. Confidence. I'm absolutely convinced that confident people are the ones who get things done. A and then the question is, it's almost a chicken and egg question. Well, where does that confidence come from? How do I get confidence? I'm convinced it's preparation. I never want to stand up and speak to a group unless I am absolutely, totally, thoroughly prepared. W without the preparation, I'd be scared to death to be up here. I think back to my college days. I went to Wake Forest and then on to Indiana University. If, if I really got on top of a course <clears throat> from the get-go, took great notes from the first class right on through, did all the extra work, uh, did more than was asked of me, I mean just on it. <clears throat> when that exam time came, I went into it with great confidence. If, for example, a course came along and I said, you know, I'm just going to kind of wing this one. I'll uh, cut a few classes. I'll do the bare minimum. You know, I'll hang out a little bit and, and then I'll really crank it up two days before. I'll get on the no dos and, you know, I'll do a whole semester in two nights and, and somehow hack. Let me tell you something. You go into that exam with your heart beating like a trip hammer. I mean, you do not have a good feeling. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And, and so the bottom line is you want to be successful the rest of your life. You be prepared every day. Never wing it. And the end result is going to be confidence that's going to put you in a good light. Here's principle number three, courtesy of Michael Jordan. You've got a couple of Michael's children on your campus, don't you? Well, well here, here's one from, uh, from their father. Uh, I wrote a book, gosh, it's almost it's 10 years ago now, called How to Be Like Mike. Uh, Michael had led the Bulls to their sixth title in 1998. It appeared he was walking off the scene permanently, and I was just fascinated by him. Didn't even have to be a sports fan, uh, but that period when the Bulls won six titles, if Michael had stayed those middle two years, they'd have won eight in a row, and if the Bulls hadn't broken it up, they'd probably have won nine straight titles. I thought, man, what a period of greatness. I mean, you don't have to be a sports fan. I mean, just, just living through that decade of absolute greatness in any field, it's fascinating, riveting. And uh, so I'm writing this book, and I had my outline ready. We, we pick up B.J. Armstrong, who had played with Michael on those first three championship teams. B.J. was with us. I took a trip with the team one night into New York, and uh, we're sitting on the bus heading to the hotel in New York. It's about 2 in the morning. I told B.J. what I was doing, showed him my outline of how to be like Mike, this book that I was writing. And I said, have I captured your old teammate? And B.J. looked at it and said, yeah, you have. He said, these are the ten principles that really capture him. But then he said... You've forgotten the most important ingredient that makes Michael Michael. And I said to BJ, I am all ears, sir. <laughs> you know, please tell me. And then BJ Armstrong said to me, <clears throat> it was his focus. That's what set him apart. And that's your third principle this morning, uh, the ability to focus. B BJ said, if the Bulls were playing tonight in Miami and it was the third quarter tonight in Miami, Michael was in the third quarter tonight in Miami. He wasn't in the fourth quarter during the third quarter. And he wasn't in last night's game back in Chicago tonight during the third quarter in Miami. He was absolutely locked in on what was going on right now. And I've discovered one of the great problems that people have, and that's why I've written a book that'll be out this summer called Extreme Focus. I have discovered that People who really struggle and drift and wander through life, 
boy, they have a tendency to meander on the rabbit trails. They get off the main highway. Uh, they're majoring in the minor instead of majoring in the major. It, it, their, their minds drift and wander, and, and it's like trying to catch a Phil Necro knuckleball with them. You know, they're just all over the map, and uh, you just can't get them channeled. So, so I am convinced that focus is an act, it's an art that you can practice, you can improve on if you're aware of it and how important it is, and how you have to absolutely go through life in many cases <clears throat> with blinders on. You watch the Kentucky Derby next May, and they'll wrestle those 20 horses into the stalls before the start of that race. And oh boy, it's an exciting time. And then the gates open and out they come with their blinders on uh, so that they're locked in just on what is in front of them. And I know enough horse owners up in Ocala, second to Lexington, Kentucky is the horse raising capital of America. And, and they will say without the blinders, those horses would be all over the track. I mean, they'd be wandering and drifting and checking up on who's over here and what this horse is doing over there and somebody on the far lane and oh, it would be a mess, total mess. So put your blinders on lock in and focus hard. And that brings us to the fourth ingredient you're going to need to be successful when you walk off this campus. And it's called passion. It's called enthusiasm. It's called excitement for what you're doing. And I've never really thought of engineers and computer scientists as passionate and enthusiastic and energetic. But, but can I give you permission to let, her, let it flow? Uh, the most contagious of all human qualities I have discovered is passion, energy, enthusiasm, excitement, or the Z words, which you never hear, but I love them. Zest, zeal, and zing old-fashioned z-words but that's what it takes to be successful in life and, and it just radiates through an organization particularly at the leadership level if you want to know the passion level the excitement level of any organization just stick a thermometer in the mouth of the leader and you'll have a quick reading in about 12 seconds that it takes for that thermometer to register passion enthusiasm excitement we've been talking here with your uh, leaders about our days in Chicago. Uh, I was the general manager of the Bulls from 1969 to 1973 and your peerless leaders here are all from that area and they've got a great heart for Chicago sports and they're all excited about the Bears this weekend and well when I think of my four years I learned about passion in Chicago the city of the big shoulders as Carl Sandburg describes it. In those days uh, the Cubs were really good and there at third base was the late Ron Santo. And Ron Santo was talking about playing third base for the Cubs on hot summer days. He said, I'd be standing down there at third base. He said, sweat pouring off me. He said, I'd reach down and grab a couple of handfuls of dirt and rub them on my hands and my wrists and my forearms to soak up the sweat. And then he said, I love the Wrigley Field dirt, said Ron Santo. And, and then uh, the Bears had Dick Butkus running around at linebacker in those days. And, and not long ago, Dick was reflecting on his career. And he said, uh, I'd love to play football. He said, I'd love to practice. He said, I'd love to dream about it. He said, I just loved it. And then somebody said, Dick, did you ever deliberately try and hurt anybody when you were playing in the NFL? He said, oh, no, no, never would have done that. Unless it was a league game or something. <laughs> and we had a guard line in Chicago, Jerry Sloan, who's still coaching Utah. Jerry Sloan and Norm Van Leer, and old-time Bulls fans will never forget them. They were not the most talented, but they led the league in floor burns every year and taking charges and diving into the stands after loose balls and led the league in technical fouls every year. And you just felt that passion from the old Chicago stadium that old-time sports fans in Chicago still feel today, 25, 35, 40 years later, because passion always prevails. And so I think an obvious question is, well, where does that passion come from? How can I get some of that? Would you like to know? I'll tell you how you get some of it. 
And it's taken me 50 years to figure this out. I'm not a social scientist, but I've come up with my little theory. You gotta love what you do. Got it? It's not very complicated, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you were looking for some really highfalutin answer. I mean, I am absolutely convinced that passion comes from loving what you do. A and when you love what you do, boy, it just flows, it just flows. So uh, have you figured out at age 21 or so what you love to do? That's awfully important. <clears throat> and, and then put shoe leather to it and go after it the rest of your life. Uh, young people come to me and say all the time and say, well, what does it take to have a successful life? And including some of my children. And I just tell them very simply, it's not very complicated. You figure out what you love to do more than anything in the world, as young as you can, possibly can, and then come up with a way to get paid for it every two weeks. <laughs> and that is important, by the way. And you'll have life right by the throat. And then can I take this one little piece further? Because we all live in Orlando, Florida. It's okay to have fun. I mean, listen, 50 million people come here to Orlando every year for one reason, to have fun. I mean, we live in the fun capital of the world. These people save up their money for years to come here for a week to spend it all just to have fun. A and, and so Walt Disney, if we could bring old Walt back for a little session with you, that's what he'd tell you. He'd say, have all the fun you can. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, even though you were going to be designing bridges and designing buildings and designing all the stuff of the future, I mean, big stuff, important stuff, coming up with computer science programs, man, it's heavy stuff. But don't forget to have some fun. Uh, Billy Graham, Dr. Graham is now 92. When he was 75 years old, the greatest evangelist in the history of the world, uh, had an interesting experience. A writer came, wanted to talk to him about his life and what he'd learned about life. And, and uh, somebody said, Billy, what do you want to be remembered for? And at 75, Dr. Graham said, that I was fun to live with. May the same be said of all of you. And that brings us to the fifth ingredient that we need to lock in here today. The next one is simply this. You've got to work hard. You've got to work hard. Let me tell you in advance, nothing's going to be handed to you. Uh, the one thing I learned, I took a business course in college, Economics 101, and, and here's what I learned in that course. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So at the end of the day, you're going to make it and you're going to have a successful life predicated on how hard you work every single day the rest of your life. No fancy theories here. You gotta lace up those work boots and get after it every day. So with that in mind, can I just share with you um, the two most important words in the English language? What else? What else? So every day the rest of your life, when you get out in the real world, you can even start practicing here on the campus. What else can I do? What else can I contribute? What else can I offer? What else can I bring? You know what I tell our interns uh, when they come and do a six month stint with us with the magic? I say, volunteer for everything. I mean, just volunteer for everything. Everything in the community, everything far beyond your little world here that you're working for six months, just volunteer for everything. Uh, Michael Hogan, the president of the University of Connecticut, was speaking to his graduates, I guess about a year and a half ago, and, and he simply said to the graduates, say yes as often as you can. He said, when you say yes, things begin. He said, when you say yes, things grow. So uh, be a yes person. Yes, let's do it. What else? Always throwing yourself into it. And here's the next ingredient we're going to need to be successful. It's called responsibility. Responsibility. We live, unfortunately, in an age of deflected responsibility. We see it all the time, particularly in leadership. Leaders make a decision. If it works out, they cannot wait to take credit. If it doesn't work out, well, what we do is hire a spin doctor to get us out of this mess, and we also develop a case of instant amnesia. 
We have no memory whatsoever of this, and then the spin doctor is to get us out of this mess because we don't want to be responsible. But I'm simply saying successful people don't operate this, that way. Mike Krzyzewski, uh, the Duke basketball coach, who at the end of the day may go down as one of the three or four greatest coaches in the history of sports in America, went to West Point. He came out of the south side of Chicago, went to West Point. He was a plebe there his first year, 18 years old. It's January, and Januaries at West Point are very gray, very depressing. Mike had his shoes polished. He was ready to go that day. Walking across the campus, an upperclassman stepped in a puddle of gook, splashed it on his beautiful new shine shoes. And right at that moment, an officer stopped him, challenged young Mike Krzyzewski on the look of the shoes. And Mike Krzyzewski said, I was just walking across the campus, sir, and I'm an upperclassman, but, and, the, and the officer just cut him off. And reminded young Mike that at West Point, when you are challenged by an officer, there are three responses. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse, sir. They have since added a fourth one for this generation. I do not understand, sir. That's been added. <laughs> but in Mike's day, it was yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. Mike Krzyzewski, who now is into his 60s, approaching his mid-60s, would tell you that that was a pivotal day in his life. He said, from that point on, he said, my approach is simply this. This was done well and I did it. This was done poorly and I did it. But I am responsible. And my young friends, you are as well. The rest of your life, you're responsible, particularly for the decisions that you make. Y you see, God gave us the ability of free choice. We are not puppets on a string. We get to make our own choices. But you see, with each choice, there's a consequence. And we've got to live with the consequences. Therefore, here's what I've learned over <coughs> 70 years. You make a series through life of good choices, your life's going to flow right well. You make some poor choices, boy, and then continue to make poor choices. Oh, it just builds and it grows. And, and, and now you get into a position it's so hard to get out of. So you are all young enough to grasp this little theory. Uh, because you're responsible for your choices, here's the best way to make good decisions. Here's the best question ever. You ready for the best question ever? Before you make any decision, big or small, the rest of your life. Here it is. Based on my past experience and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? There's the best question ever. And so every time you have a decision to make, whether it's uh, buying that uh, big extra tub of ice cream at Publix, or who you're going to marry, or a choice with your job or your hiring, based on my past experience and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? Here's the next principle. Think the right thoughts, and always, always think in an optimistic manner. The power of your mind is staggering, <coughs> and everything that's going to happen in your life is how you operate this little two-and-a-half-pound cantaloupe-sized computer up here in your cranium. It's unbelievable what that little two-and-a-half-pounder can do triggers everything that happens in your life, triggers everything that happens in the world. To get a computer, I am told, and I'm teaching, talking to computer scientists here, but I am told to get a computer, you guys can figure this out, to get a computer to do everything this little two and a half pounder does, you'd have to build that computer the size of Dallas, Texas, and it would have to be 22 stories tall. I mean, that's what you got going on right here. Boy, it's a powerful little source. But it needs exercise. It needs a good workout. Just like your heart and lung and your muscles, skeletal muscles, need to be worked out every day to be really healthy. That's why we get on Stairmasters, and that's why we jog and swim, and that's why we lift weights to build those muscles. This muscle needs exercise every day. 
good, hard, solid, tough, intense exercise. And unfortunately, the Nautilus and hammer strength people have not come up with a piece of equipment that attaches to it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Just, just sit down and attach something here and well, that'd be awesome. It hadn't happened yet. Maybe you guys can figure that out. But there's a wonderful little device that does attach beautifully to that little computer. And uh, let me demonstrate for you. It is called, ladies and gentlemen, a book. And the exercise is called reading. That's the best workout for this little cantaloupe. A and every time you attach a book to it, man, oh man, that's like going to Gold's Gym for your brain. So, so here's my challenge. And I got to tell you in advance, you all live in a screen generation. I mean, your computers have been attached for a long time to television screens and movie screens and computer screens and video games. Ooh, don't get me started on that. <laughs> and uh, basically, the screens carry a, a mindset of uh, entertain me, make it easier for me. You know what books say? Challenge me. Make me work. I mean, make this muscle really dig. That's how it gets stronger and sharper. So here's a little drill. This has nothing to do with your schoolwork, nothing whatsoever to do with your academics. This is just for you for the rest of your life. I'm going to challenge you starting tomorrow. Give you the day off. Starting tomorrow. What's tomorrow? The 22nd? Would you write that date down, please? January 22nd, 2011. It's a big day in your life. I'm going to challenge you starting tomorrow, the rest of your life, to read one hour every day, the rest of your life, from a book. Not the same book, <laughs> but from books. The good news is, in this drill, you pick the books. This has nothing to do with schoolwork. You pick the books. They're not assigned. And never pick up a book you're not interested in. That has nothing to do with your schoolwork, you understand? <laughs> don't go running out of here and say, Mr. Williams said, I don't have to. You're picking the books, books that you're interested in. Doesn't matter how you do the hour. It can be one 60-minute session or 61-minute sessions. But if you will read an hour a day, at the end of one week, you will have finished a book, a regular size book. It won't be War and Peace, but you'll have finished a book. And you say to me, big deal. It's a huge deal. Because the average man, upon finishing high school, will not read another book the rest of his life. 85% of all the books purchased in this country are purchased by women. <laughs> Only 5% of the American public will ever set foot in a bookstore in their lifetime. The Wall Street Journal reported a few years ago that 59% of the homes in America don't have one book in them, including a cookbook or the Bible. And now author Rick Warren tells us over half the world is illiterate. And I don't know how you respond to that, but boy, that's terrifying news to me. And, and your generation has got to stop that immediately and turn it really fast. Because our brains are just shriveling up because they're not getting enough exercise. Reading will do the trick for you. So if you read an hour a day at the end of one week, you'll have read a book. In one year, that's 52 books that you're interested in. And if you read the right five books on any one subject, you'll be considered a world-leading authority on that subject. So one year from today, you can be a world-leading authority on 10 different subjects by reading an hour a day. In 10 years, if you continue that, when you guys are 31 years old, you'll have read 520 books that you're interested in, and you can become world-leading authorities on over 100 different subjects by reading an hour a day. Life-changing stuff. Can you imagine at 31 when you go in for your job interview, your second job interview? And, and there's going to be so much pouring out from your little cantaloupe that it's just going to sweep that interviewing committee right out of the room. They're going to be blown away. But it starts tomorrow, January 22nd, 2011. Huge day in your life. <laughs> Final piece. Character still counts. Character still counts. Did you hear me? Character still counts. Can I talk about two character qualities that will always carry you in good stead? Number one, <coughs> honesty. A as you go out into the real world, for you to really have success, every time you open your mouth, everybody you work with, your employers, 
your clients, everybody you spend time with has got to know that when you speak, it's money in the bank. And there's a tendency out there in your generation, because I've heard it, that uh, I got to cut corners. Uh, I've got to shade the truth to get ahead. Not true. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, probably your favorite little lunch sandwich, right? Uh, Truett Cathy's 88 years old. I heard him, I shared a program with him a couple of years ago in Atlanta. He's got a Georgia drawl so intense, you need a translator to figure out what he's saying. But here's what he said to that group that day. I'll never forget it. He said, you can be honest and successful at the same time. Isn't that something? I mean, the founder of Chick-fil-A, this multi-billion dollar industry, and uh, which closes on Sunday. You can be honest and successful at the same time. I hope you never forget that. And then the second character quality is this. It's called integrity. It's an interesting word. It comes from the root word integer, which means one. Uh, that would then lead to a word like integrated. An integrated society is one society. So a man or a woman of integrity, there's a consistency to their life. I think that's the best way to share it with you. Uh, they, they walk and talk in the same direction. The opposite of integrity is one who talks one way and walks the other. Boy, you are really good to confuse people when that starts happening. Uh, when you get into an organization, I mean, people will be more confused than a termite in a yo-yo when they see a lack of integrity in your life. So let me wrap this all up by telling you a quick Tony Dungy story. I ran into Ken Whitten Tony Dungy's pastor for many years in Tampa a few years ago. And here's what he said. The tongue in Tony Dungy's mouth is always pointing in the same direction as the tongue in his shoes. And then he said, every time Tony leaves a city where he's been coaching, that city is better off for him having been there. May the same be said of you. Go get them. I'll be following you, rooting for you, praying for you. Knock them dead out there in the real world. I know you can do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You all are very kind. Very kind. Now, I know some of you have got to head off and get to other classes. I know lunch is waiting. Uh, as I understand it, I've got a 20-minute period to do questions and answers. Anything I might have said that triggered a question, anything that you are struggling with, anything I can give you counsel with, now's the time to do it. Because who knows if our paths will ever cross again. So don't be bashful. Who's up? Yes, just stand up, please, so we can hear you and speak loud enough so we can all hear. Great question, and uh, when, I, when I first got this assignment, uh, I was going to speak on leadership, and then the direction was to go into a more individual approach. Uh, so, and, and your question, sir, was not planted, but I'm very grateful for it. So let me give you a mini discussion on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. It always has and it always will. It will always be a topic of great fascination in our country. I mean, when you go back and study the early days of our country, Revolutionary War period, it was all about leadership through the Civil War, through World War II. Today, every time you turn on uh, Fox News or CNBC or pick up any newspaper, it's an analyzation <laughs> of leadership. Listen to sports talk radio, they spend all day long analyzing coaches and GMs and owners evaluating them as leaders. So I think the obvious question is, what does it take to be a great leader? I read extensively on it. Uh, I've got now about 650 books in my leadership library at home. 
I've been in positions of leadership in professional sports now for almost 50 years, and here's what I come away with. Uh, I am convinced that it doesn't matter if you were leading in the Revolutionary War period, leading during the Civil War, leading today in the engineering field, or leading in government, or the church, or education, or sports, seven qualities you're gonna need to be an outstanding leader. And they all have to be there. It's not a smorgasbord, you can't pick and choose. So let's, uh, let's start with number one, it's called vision. I am convinced that the key ingredient to an outstanding leader is called vision. The vision thing, which has come into our vocabulary. Nothing has ever happened of significance in this country or this world where a leader did not have a vision. I would love to sit down <coughs> with your president, uh, Dr. Hitt, and reminisce with him from when he came, what, 18 years ago, something like that? And, and is gonna be here for a while. Uh, what was his vision for UCF 18 years ago? What is his vision today? I've asked a couple of questions here already. What will this school be like 20 years from now? When you guys are f in your early 40s and you come back for football weekends, you know, what's it gonna be like here? I think Dr. Hitt would tell you he's got a vision. He could pretty well tell it to you because leadership always, always, always starts with vision. Here's the second key ingredient, linked to the first. It's called communicating your vision. Leaders, you can have a vision all you want, but if you can't communicate it effectively, I'll tell you in advance, nothing's gonna happen. So how do you communicate a vision? First of all, you've gotta believe philosophically it's important to communicate within your organization. There are a lot of companies, a lot of organizations out there, they just don't talk to each other. Nobody knows what's going on. The, the top brass sits up in their ivory towers shooting emails across to each other or texting or tweeting each other and uh, nobody communicates. You gotta believe it's important. Secondly, communicate in a way that people understand. Listen, I have been in so many meetings over the years. You come out after a 90 minute meeting and you whisper to your seatmate, what did they say in there? Did they decide anything? C could you translate what went on in that meeting back there for the last hour and a half? I mean, communicate in a way that people can understand simply and, and to directly and to the point. Three little principles, be clear, be concise, be correct. That works in marriages too, by the way. <laughs> works wonderfully in parenting. Works great with coaches and athletes, uh, professors and students. Be clear, be concise, be correct. And then I wanna tell you another, key piece here about communicating. You've got to do it verbally. Verbally, in front of other people. And that's where fear hits. The number one fear in every poll is never death or snakes or spiders. It's always standing in front of a group of people and talking about anything. The most important two courses I took at Wake Forest were not in my major field. They were two electives under Professor James Walton. Never will forget him. The first one was called Introduction to Speech. The other was called Oral Interpretation of Literature. I mean, those were two radical courses in my life. Little did I realize as a 20, 21 year old that those two courses were gonna lay the foundation to my whole career. I kind of thought they might, uh, but as I look back, they really did. So uh, jump into a speech course. Engineers and computer, computer scientists who can really communicate in front of others, oh boy, they're gonna be really valuable. I have learned that, that leadership generally gravitates to that man or woman who can communicate, who can talk. Generally gravitate, that's generally who we elect to office. It's generally who wins the job interview. Generally the man or the woman who elevates in organizations, who can communicate and talk in front of other people. And so when you think about the history of our nation, <coughs> listen, we, we still hear the voice of great leaders. Uh, yesterday was the 50th anniversary of President John Kennedy's inaugural address, 50 years ago. That was my junior year at Wake Forest. And it was a cold, bitter cold day in Washington when young, dashing President Kennedy, 42 years old, stands there without a top coat on. I mean, the wind, it's a sunny day, but this clipped New England accent. And the word, world heard his voice. Let the word go forth from this time and place 
to friend and foe alike, that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. The world still hears his voice. Here's the third leadership principle, people skills. Great leaders have people skills. They have a heart for people. They care about people. They're interested in other people. They have empathy for people. They love people. So please understand, you've studied and majored in engineering and computer science, but that's not what you're doing. You're not going into the engineering business. We're all in the people business. I've been in professional basketball for 43 years. But I'm not in the pro basketball world. I'm in the people business. And that's what great leaders do. They have a heart for people. They care about people. Richard Lapchick, uh, who heads up the DeVos Sports Management School here, good friend, the Jiminy Cricket of sports conscience, you know, he's a remarkable guy, uh, has written extensively with and about uh, Coach Eddie Robinson, who coached football at Grambling University starting in 1941 for 57 straight years. He died a few years ago at 88. Richard talks in detail about the funeral. Now listen, you don't just drop into Grambling. You gotta fly to Shreveport, Louisiana, rent a car, drive out into the country. It's not easy to get there. At his funeral, they estimate in the field house and overflowing about 9,500 people. And uh, before Willie Davis, Hall of Famer, who played at Grambling, spoke, he just simply said, how many of Coach Eddie's former players are here? And they estimate about 2,400 former players stood up, many of them elderly men. You know, from the 1940s, they'd have to be in their 80s. And they estimate about 2,400 had come from all over the country, at great personal sacrifice to be there. And then I thought it was Eddie Robinson who said, you gotta coach every player as if he was gonna marry your daughter. And then he said, you can't coach him if you don't love him. That's what it takes to be a great leader. Here's the fourth quality of leadership. It's called character counts in leadership. There's been a debate in our country for a decade or more one argument says if the polls are good and the economy is good, the character stuff doesn't matter that much. If, if the bottom line looks good, the character stuff is irrelevant. The other argument is you can't lead without character. I mean, there's a real tension in our country. But I'm going to argue with you today that you can only go as high on the leadership ladder as your character will allow you. And the higher you go on the leadership ladder, if you have character flaws, believe me, they will be discovered either by a probing media or a Facebook deal or somebody who takes a picture somewhere, I mean, it's gonna get, you're gonna get nailed. I mean, you can't turn around today in society without being nailed. So, so character is gonna determine how high you go on the leadership ladder. Here's the fifth quality of leadership, it's called competence. Leaders are good at what they do, and that begs the question, how did they get good? Were they born that way or were they developed? I wrote a book a few years ago called Coaching Your Kids to Be Leaders, and I interviewed about 800 men and women in leadership positions, and one of the questions I asked them was, are leaders born or made? And about 85% responded by saying, they are made. And I was thrilled. If it had been the other way around, I'd have had to call Warner Books and say, no need to write this book because these people are all born this way. Well, listen, we all come into the world with different parenting backgrounds and different environment and different skills and different DNA. But at the end of the day, we can all get better as leaders. 
we can all improve. Our competency can get better. So I want to share with you one competency just to think about. <clears throat> I think at the end of the day, leadership is about solving problems. When you really think about it. Uh, Colin Powell, the general, said leadership is solving problems and when people stop bringing you their problems, you're through as a leader. That's what General Powell believes. So you're going to have problems ahead. And as I look back over my life, I, I did not like problems. Oh, if I could have gotten the problems out of my hair, why, who needs these? But as I look back now, the, the growing periods of my life, when I really made progress, when I really began to advance, was when the problems came and I dealt with them head on and began to get to the bottom of them and, and really deal with problems. That's how you grow. Listen, anybody can lead during the good times. I mean, if it's all sunshine and balloons and birthday parties, you know, anybody can lead in those periods. But it's when the problems hit, that's when leaders really grow. That's why we admire George Washington so much and Abraham Lincoln. Listen, we, we shut down the nation for a, a day in February. We shut down the whole country for a day in January to celebrate Dr. King's birthday. Well, the only reason we do that, as far as I can figure, is because they dealt with enormous problems and, and got them resolved to a large degree, and, and we honor them to this day. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Dwight D. Eisenhower during World War II. I mean, we wouldn't absolutely be agog with those leaders if they didn't have a zillion problems that they helped resolve and get under control. Don't run from those problems. That's where leaders really grow and advance. And then the uh, sixth quality of leadership is called boldness. Not baldness, boldness. Uh, leaders at some point have to step up and lead. They've got to take charge. A and uh, let me tell you about my son, Bobby. Uh, we have 19 children. We've adopted 14 of them. We have a most unusual international family. Bobby is one of the homegrowns. Went to Edgewater High School here, went to Rollins got his master's at Georgia Southern, went right into pro baseball, uh, his life is baseball, went in as a Reds coach right out of college, and after five years with the Reds, the Washington Nationals called him and offered him a managerial post. He was 27 years old when that call came five years ago this week uh, to manage in their farm system, 27. <clears throat> Youngest manager in organized baseball. Bobby called me that day to tell me what was going on. His voice was up about four octaves. <laughs> Dad! I heard him say, what do I do now? And all I could think of was that movie, The Candidate, where Robert Redford's running for the Senate and it's all over and he's elected and there he is in that little office they've got and he says, what do we do now? <laughs> Bobby said, what do I do now? You know what I said to him? <clears throat> I said, Bobby, be the boss. I didn't say be a boss. I just said, Bobby, be the boss. I didn't say be bossy. I said, Bobby, be the boss. You know why I said that? I have learned over the years you get one crack at leadership, generally. One opportunity to be the high school principal or the head football coach or the senior pastor. One crack at being the president of the college or the governor of the state or the CEO of the company or the President of the United States, you get one crack. And can I tell you the worst feeling in the world? Deep into your retirement, sitting in front of the crackling fireplace in your retirement colony, or maybe you're up, even up at the villages. I'll tell you the worst feeling in the world is sitting there saying, oh, as I look back, I was always skating on thin ice. I was always tiptoeing around the edges. I wanted everybody to like me. I didn't want to offend anybody. I'm just telling you that's the worst feeling in the world. That's why I tell young leaders, step up and lead. It's called boldness. And then the final piece I want to put in place here, the seventh side of leadership that sets good leaders off from Hall of Fame leaders. You, you want to be a leader who goes down in the history books, the seventh side has to be there. It's called a serving heart. That's what I've noticed about the great leaders. They have a serving heart. They understand it's not all about me, it's really about you. And, and I am here 
to be of service to you. That's why I lead. Now, Rick Warren, the author, points out uh, it is service, not serve us. And, and when a young man or a young woman, and the earlier the better, grasp that idea that for the rest of my leadership career, I'm going to wear an apron every day to work. Because on every apron, it simply says, shape to serve. I mean, you really study the embroiderment on an apron, shape to serve. That's what aprons are there for. And when you get men and women in leadership positions wearing aprons, I'm here to serve, you've got something special. So let me put it all together in verse form. Here's the summation of this wonderful question, which you asked, and trust me, it was not planted. Seven things one must do to be a leader right and true. A vision that is strong and clear. Communicate <coughs> so they will hear. People's skills based in love and character that's far above. The competence to solve and teach and boldness that has fearless reach. A serving heart that stands close by to help, assist, and edify. There's Leadership 101 in a nutshell for you.